Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fifth annual Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. My name is Erica Hazel, and I am the Vallejo community organizer for the event. We have an amazing program in store for you today, and this is the first of three weeks, and we are so excited to have you here. This year, we have moved our event online due to the COVID-19 pandemic that has affected so many of our communities. It is our sincerest hope that that you and your family members are staying safe and healthy. For the fifth year of the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival, we have decided to adapt the event to this virtual platform. Each week, we are centering the event around a special theme. We have created a schedule filled with exciting videos, cooking demos, interviews, and performances, all celebrating the diversity and culture of Vallejo. Our theme for this week is getting your hands dirty. We are also celebrating Latinx Heritage Month. And just to let you know, September 15th through October 15th marks the celebration of the cultures, contributions, and resilience of Latinx and Latinx identified communities around the world. The timing of Latinx Heritage Month coincides with the Independence Day celebration of several nations in Central and Latin America. September 15th was chosen as the first day of the month-long celebration because it coincides with Independence Day celebrations in five countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Those five nations declared their independence from Spain on September 15th, 1821, and Mexico celebrates its independence the next day on September 16th. To celebrate our theme for today, we are going to dig in and get our hands dirty in both the kitchen as well as the garden. After that, we have a very special cooking demonstration as well as a beautiful Mexican dance performance to share with you. Finally, we will learn about the importance of voting in this year's elections. At the end of the day's program, we will respond to all the questions you have for us. As a reminder, you can send us your questions throughout the event. Please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will respond to them during the Q&A session. As a reminder, if you're one of the first 16 participants who joins us for all of our events, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook for Vallejo residents. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. But before we get started, I want to introduce our organization behind this amazing festival, Food Empowerment Project, or FEP for short. FEP is a registered nonprofit, 501c3, that promotes veganism, fights for farm workers, works on the lack of access to healthy foods in communities of color, and encourages people to not buy chocolate sourced from some of the worst forms of child labor. The upcoming video will introduce you to our work and our hope for our planet and its inhabitants to better understand the connection between people, non-human animals, and our environment. Please join me and welcome Food Empowerment Project into your home. Food is power. Our food system is a huge interconnected web stretching across the globe. It links fields to factories, human animals to non-human animals, workers to corporations. When we choose what to have for dinner, we're not just choosing what to eat. We're also choosing whether or not to support the industries that put the food on our plates. That's a lot of responsibility, but it's a lot of power too. For those of us who are able to make informed, ethical food choices, we can make a real difference in the lives of humans, non-human animals, and the earth. At Food Empowerment Project, or FEP, we believe that our food choices can change the world, and we want to show you how. The most incredible thing our food choices can do is reduce the amount of suffering in the world. How? Well, each year, tens of billions of non-human animals are exploited in our food production systems. Each one of them is an individual who is aware of their own existence, feels pleasure and pain, and wants to be safe and free. They are confined, separated from their families, mutilated, and killed. Our food choices can reduce the amount of suffering of non-human animals when cutting out meat, dairy, and other animal products. 
FEP promotes ethical veganism, encouraging people not to contribute to the exploitation and suffering of animals, both human and non-human. Our website is full of information to help people understand the power of their food choices and learn how these choices can impact non-human animals from chickens and rabbits to fishes and other sea creatures. And it also includes some recipes and meal ideas. To support this further, Food Empowerment Project has created two vegan websites, one featuring delicious Mexican food in English and Spanish, and one with amazing Filipinx recipes in English and Tagalog to help people go and stay vegan. So ethical veganism is important, but not everybody can get the kind of food they need for a healthy plant-based diet. If we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables, we need to make sure that all people have access to fresh, affordable produce. In black and brown communities and in low-income neighborhoods, access to fresh fruit and vegetables is often limited or non-existent. It is vital that we acknowledge the ways that racism and economic disadvantage prevent marginalized communities from being able to access healthier food. When invited, FEP makes an assessment on the availability of healthy foods and begins to work with local communities, policymakers, and community organizations. We then convene focus groups to determine the barriers seen and experienced by the community to help create solutions that will benefit the health of individuals over corporations. But we can't stop there. We want to get fresh produce on more shelves and on more plates. And those fruits and vegetables have to come from somewhere. We want people to think about the ways their food choices can reduce the suffering of non-human animals in our food system. But what about the humans in that system? Farm workers are some of the most vulnerable and exploited workers in the United States. They often work long hours in extreme heat, are exposed to agricultural chemicals, and many experience homelessness due to their low wages or wage theft. Also, many are migrant or undocumented workers who are threatened with deportation if they speak up, which leaves them vulnerable to a variety of abuses. In addition, female farm workers experience sexual harassment on a regular basis. We advocate for improvements to farm worker rights at corporate, legislative, and regulatory levels. In 2018, we helped overturn a rule that had forced the families of farm workers to move at least 50 miles away from the migrant camps when picking season was over, a regulation that negatively impacted their children's education. This victory meant that their children could now finish their school year without having to move. On a grassroots level, FEP organizes a school supply drive for the children of farm workers to help ensure these kids are offered all the opportunities that come with an education, something their parents have sacrificed so much for so that they might have opportunities previous generations may not have had. The fight for farm workers' rights doesn't end at the borders of the United States. We have a responsibility to the people who supply us with our food, even when they're on the other side of the world. Some of the worst human rights abuses in our food system happen in the supply chain for that confection we all love so much, chocolate. The chocolate industry gets much of its key ingredient, cacao, from areas where the worst forms of child labor and slavery are most prevalent. Children as young as seven work long hours using dangerous equipment and in some cases are not allowed to leave the farms they work on and are beaten and sometimes not seen again if they tried to flee. They go through all this just to make candy for us to eat halfway around the world. By informing people where their chocolate comes from, we can create transparency to help people eat with their ethics. On our website, Food Empowerment Project has a list of chocolate companies to let consumers know which companies we do and do not recommend based on the country of origin for their cacao. And we even have a free downloadable app to make it easy for those who have a smartphone. 
be sure to look out for our mascot, Chavez, to see which chocolates we recommend. Our food choices are powerful. That means people are powerful. And that means you are powerful. Food Empowerment Project is about showing people just how much power their food choices hold. We want everybody to understand how much good their food choices can do, how much suffering we can stop. But we understand that making the world more just and equal is not a simple task. We can't just think about humans or just non-human animals or just the earth. We have to understand the way that these things are interconnected and the complicated systems they create. Together, we can help each other understand the whole picture. Then, we can work toward a better world. Remember, food is power. Use it with compassion. Thank you so much for spending this time to learn more about Food Empowerment Project and our work. We hope this helped you better understand our organization and our connections to one another and to our planet. Next, we would like to honor the life and legacy of, of an important Vallejoan. Our hearts were shattered earlier this year with the loss of Maria Rivera. Maria became Food Empowerment Project's community organizer in 2016, which truly set the stage for all of our work in Vallejo, including our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. She was instrumental in coordinating the seven focus groups we conducted in Vallejo on the lack of access to healthy foods as well as her work with the professors and students at Turo University to help with the analysis of our focus groups. Maria's enthusiasm and love for her community and its people was infectious. She founded Vallejo Together to help those in the community experiencing homelessness and also made time to work on other projects in the community, including co-founding Unity Day as a way to celebrate the diverse community that is Vallejo. Maria was always working to connect people who were passionate about making a difference and many of whom we are honored to continue working with to this day. In fact, we met Chef Evangelina and Chef Chu through Maria's excitement for helping to make Vallejo healthier. She also introduced us to Ballet Folklorico and other incredible performers from the community. Today, Maria's work continues in the Vallejo community, not only through Food Empowerment Project, but also through Vallejo Together. Now please join me in honoring the life and legacy of Maria Gravera.
Thank you for taking the time to honor Maria Guevara's life and all that she has done for our community. Next, we are very excited to have Vallejo's very own Chef Evangelina join us for another fantastic cooking demonstration. She is the owner of All in All Vegan, a vegan nutrition catering service that inspires others to make healthy improvements in their diets. Each year, when we have been able to host the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival in person, we have offered the community free food. In 2016, Chef Evangelina made all of the food we served that year, including the vegan chicken adobo and frijoles de la olla. With her amazing vegan dishes, Chef Evangelina shares her passion for nutritious and delicious foods with her community. In fact, she also made all of the vegan food for Food Empowerment Project's seven Vallejo residents focus groups where participants said, and I quote, if she did all the cooking, I could go vegan. Community members were also wowed as she served food at our community meetings to talk about bringing worker-owned cooperatives to our community. We are honored to also have Chef Evangelina's recipes on the websites veganmexicanfood.com and veganfilipinofood.com, as well as their corresponding recipe books too. Her innate warmth and her love for teaching people how food really matters is clear in the video you're about to watch. She will talk about how veganism changed her life, share a bit of Mexican history, and teach us how to listen to our food sing while making the celebratory Mexican dish, chiles en nogados. Now please join me in the kitchen of Chef Evangelina. My name is Chef Evangelina and welcome to my home. I'm so thankful that we have been allowed this platform to carry on with our uh, Vallejo Healthy Food Fest, uh, thanks to Food Empowerment. So uh, we've been going through a lot of different things with the COVID crisis, the shelter in place, and yet having fun. So, um, oh, also not getting a haircut for eight months. So anyway, we're just gonna bear with everything and um, just enjoy. So uh, let's get this recipe started. Well, I wanted to share a little bit about the history of the dish which we're going to make. Um, the name is chiles en hogadas, which means uh, chilies with these poblanos uh, in a walnut cream sauce. The commander of Mexico, military commander, named Agustin de Iturbide. Okay, so back in 1821, uh, he signed a Treaty of Cordoba. I mean, it was actually the treaty uh, to give Mexico the independence from Spain. So it was, he, people were just so happy. Well, he was headed back to, um, back to uh, Mexico City and he stopped in Puebla, Mexico, and that is where this dish was created in Puebla, Mexico. Uh, the nuns from the Santa Monica convent had wanted to make something very, very special that uh, represented the flag of Mexico, and, at that, and it was red and green and white, which comes from the nut cream sauce. And so uh, I was introduced to this dish uh, back in, Oh, I don't know what year it was, but it was, uh, I was not vegan at the time, and I had read the book with water for chocolate, and it was, it was so neat to me because I've always loved to, to cook, and so uh, it just showed the lady, who the star of the book, uh, her passion for food and for cooking. I uh, decided to make the dish vegan uh, a couple, three years ago. And uh, I've only been vegan for about five years, and it, it, it's just changed my life. I'm so excited about that. Uh, I was in a wheelchair for 20 years, uh, on and off. It wasn't, I wasn't paralyzed. I had an injury to my back but because of pain and, uh, and different things. I uh, had to use a wheelchair, and I not looked back once. I thought, I've eaten enough steak to last a lifetime. So I was happy 
and I still remain happy and I enjoy making new recipes of things I used to have. So I know that uh, we're gonna enjoy today. I've decided to do a little mixture of um, uh, mushrooms because I think mushrooms taste a lot like that, especially portobellas, uh, a lot like that combined with nuts. And, and then it um, also includes a lot of different fruits. The dish is amazingly filled with different flavors that pop in your mouth. So um, I think it's gonna be exciting for you. It is a little bit more uh, labor intensive uh, because it's a celebration dish uh, that you might make, you know, twice a year. Uh, sometimes when I take shortcuts, we can do it more than that. But uh, it, it is labor intensive, but I think you'll enjoy it and you'll have a dish that you'll love forever. One of the great things that you can do what I like to do is I like to break it down. And so in this recipe, we have the sauce, we have the chilies, and we have the stuffing. If you have a gas stove, fantastic. Uh, it's great uh, because um, you get an even char because we're gonna char these. Uh, and But if you don't have, and you can use your oven, I am going to show you both ways. Oh, the smell is just, it's wonderful. You can see here that uh, the chile has gotten completely uh, charred. It's all blackened all the way around, even those little nooks and crannies because it's direct heat. Then you can place it in a bag. The reason for this is so that it uh, gets steamed and it loosens the skin and it's easier to take that char off. You hear that? That means they're blistering. I love that sound. All of them done. Now here after oven roasting mm -hmm. um, or charring, because you, you do the broiler, uh, you can see that it's also all black. The chilies are less firm, but you put them in a tea towel that has been moistened with water and uh, cover them also for about 15, 20 minutes, even 30 is great, uh, but it will loosen that skin. You need to be careful as you're uh, pulling off the char uh, because you don't want to take away, uh, peel away the, the meat of the chile. It's, uh, you want to keep the chile as intact as you possibly can. And it's a little more difficult when you um, have to peel them this way. After you've peeled them, uh, you want to put your gloves on, probably during the whole process, uh, and de-seed them. Uh, there's also little veins in there that you um, will find it's uh, better to take them off. Um, it, uh, you won't have as much heat coming from the chile. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. They are much softer and um, more cooked because they've been steamed in the oven, of course. Now, here is the chard, direct char, and I'm using the back of a knife and you can see how it easily comes off. You don't have to try to peel it you just gently um, can do this back and forth motion and that comes off quite easily. Some people, um, after they've charred, I mean, taken off the skin, they will run it under the uh, faucet to clean all those little bits and pieces. I don't um, recommend that uh, because it takes also some of the flavor away from the chile you want to get that beautiful flavor. And if you're sensitive to heat, um, it also will um, take the heat away. So um, maybe you'd like to do that. But I just rub it with a little uh, paper towel, a uh, little cloth to get those charred bits off. And as you're cutting through it, make sure that you are doing it gently so you don't go all the way to the other side but you can slice it and also do the same thing, uh, de-seeding it. 
This dish is so beautiful. I um, love it. This time of the year in September, of course, in Mexico, they are celebrating the 16th of September, which is the uh, their freedom, their independence. And um, they use all these beautiful seasonal dishes. Uh, I think the, the nuns that I spoke of in the story uh, that I gave at the very beginning, uh, they went out and looked for all the the freshest fruit and so during this time it's just beautiful to note that you can make this especially uh, that celebration because the uh, fruits and vegetables are they're seasonal and they're fresh and um, I think that makes it always exciting to me when I'm making the dish because I know I'm getting fresh ingredients and you can see here Taking out all the seeds is very, very important. And you can see also the difference, the contrast between the oven roasted and or, or charred broiled and the other um, direct flame. This one is much softer. And if you like that chili more cooked, this is the way to go. So we've just finished doing the chilies and uh, we're getting back to our walnut sauce. So here we have the walnuts and the milk. And we are probably going to use a little bit of milk in case we want to save some back, so I don't want to just throw it away. But I have a little sieve here and empty this out. And we have our sour cream. I'm going to put these nuts in here, and I have the the date as well that's in there it's softened i'm going to put a little sour cream and normally it calls for sweet cream or in mexico crema fresa. and this is pretty noisy if you have a vitamix it does tend to make it a lot smoother but if you don't and you have a blender just let it run longer because that's you just want to make sure that it's a nice creamy sauce so I finished that noisy job and I'm going to put that in a container. So one of the things that I think is real important to do to have a nice and calm way of cooking is to get everything in its place. That means when you look at your recipe, you say it has chopped, parsley, chopped spinach, chopped pecans, all of these things that it has, you want to try to get those done before and have them in their, their place. Uh, it's called mise en place. One of the things also about this recipe that I learned, which was really nice, it was um, that uh, they use cactus and they cure it, I think it's candied. However, it's very difficult to, um, to even get, even in Mexico, because it's on the endangered species. It's actually a, one of those round cactus, and um, bis, bis naga, I think it's called. I hope that was right, but um, bisnaga. And uh, so I was trying to think of something I could possibly use that might have that flavor, um, that texture I was thinking of a, a, a cactus, and then um, what could be used. So, uh, but it's sweet, but it has, you know, when you sweeten different uh, things like a cactus, it has a thick kind of a feel, and then it's very sweet. Here I have my, my uh, peaches. And this is a, a, um, a recipe that has so many flavors. Talk about a party in your mouth. It, it has so many flavors because um, we have, and you can change some of the things if you don't like. Sometimes they use uh, pears. I'm using, I think the more traditional thing is a peach, a pear, and an apple. But there was one time I made it, I did not have any peaches, but I had some nectarines and I, I kind of thought that was even better. But uh, you don't want your fruit to be too, too soft. Um, 
because you're going to be cooking it with and and it will get mushy so you don't want that to happen uh, I have peeled because of this the way the skin of the peach and the pear are I peeled both of those but the apple I think has a beautiful beautiful color and it adds to that dish so um, and you don't also want to make these too small because then you will definitely they will definitely go to mush my main point is get your stuff together and then have them in these little containers or um, in a plate separate however you want to do it uh, and then it's much easier. You don't have to be dashing, oh, now I have to chop this, now I have to chop that. Get it all done and have it ready for you so when you cook, you don't have to be running around. So we're gonna start with our filling. Well, not start, we're going to continue with our filling. And uh, I have all the things I need out here. Like I said, the mise en place are everything in its place. You want to have your pan nice and hot, and I would suggest, of course, the best way to do this and, uh, and so that you're not frustrated is to have a good nonstick pan. So I have just gotten this nice and hot, and I'm just about two tablespoons of water. Let that bubble. Then we're going to add our onions. Now, I am allergic to the raw onion when I eat that. So for me, this is a lot of onions. Normally, I would use a, a planer, a microplane, and, but I wanted to do it this way. I love the taste of onions, but they have to be what I call dead, really dead. So you see me, I just put this all in. And the hardest part for me about water frying is patience. Because I want to look at them and, and I want to do my little thing. But what you need to do is just let them sit there. They're going to start browning on the edges. But the only way they're going to brown is if you let them set. So you saw me put the water. I poured the onions in. And then you just let it set until you start seeing some little browning on the edges. And when you see the browning on the edges, you know it's time to uh, turn them. Okay, so you see, it's been a few minutes and you can see that they're starting to brown. And you may ask, why do you want them to brown? because there's flavor in the brown. Now you can turn them over and you can see how they have actually browned. That's caramelization. And now what I'm gonna do is do this again. And it, you can see that it's pretty dry now. So I'm gonna add a little bit more water. Down again. They're cooking and browning. Beautiful! When I put the onions in, I didn't put the garlic in because garlic tends to burn a little more. So, what I'm going to do is now add the garlic. Now, I haven't used oil on this, but I am going to use oil now a little bit and some butter. These are tablespoons, I mean teaspoons. So I'm just adding one teaspoon there because I'm going to add, I'm gonna bring the fire down a little bit because it's pretty high. So you see all these mushrooms and mushrooms are wonderful. Uh, 
need a little more water. I am going to add a bay leaf to this, and that's going to be remain throughout the whole uh, cooking process. And you can just oh, I smell it already. I like to throw a bay leaf in my rice when I'm making it, and um, just gives that you can smell it all over the house. One teaspoon of oil that gives the mushrooms because mushrooms tend to be they can get mushy. And right now, with all that steam, you want to just crisp them up a little bit. And we're just going to let that water evaporate. So the water has evaporated quite a bit. So we are now just letting it toast on there. But I am going to start adding a few more things. One thing that I love that uh, is not in the recipe, but one of the things that helps uh, give a um, meatier taste, uh, fuller taste, is um, to me is uh, bell peppers. So we're putting, this is actually one whole bell pepper. And I'm going to mix that up. Just put layer after layer after layer. Now, I, you notice, normally, um, when chefs are cooking, they talk a lot about layering, uh, salt. And so every time you add something else, you add a little bit of salt which is why things in a restaurant can be very, very salty. And um, you do not need that much salt. I'm going to add the parsley. Looking so beautiful. Since they're going in there together, I chop the uh, walnuts and the pecans together. You can always just put them, in, like I said before, in a food processor um, or chop them by hand. But I'm going to add that now. So you notice I've done more of the vegetable uh, nuts, the harder things. That um, and if you see that it's getting a little dry. Uh, then what you want to do is not use more oil or butter, but use water. And that's just a little bit of a sprinkle. And you'll notice I haven't used any salt, uh, no seasonings. Every one of these things has so much flavor. And uh, so we want the, the vegetables and the fruits to sing to us. And uh, sometimes when we use too many spices, um, even though I'm not saying it's bad, but um, first you want to see if all the all the music that comes from here the, the, um, that is being sung in the pan with just the vegetables. One thing that I am going to do because we're using mushrooms is this is a tablespoon of low sodium tamari, and you can use um, and I'm not even using that much. That might have been two teaspoons. Uh, but if you prefer using uh, liquid aminos, that's also good. My family doesn't care for that, so uh, I'm just using the tamari. Low sodium tamari. And I'm missing my hubby. He's usually with me when I do presentations, but he's very busy today. And um, so. He's not with me. But here we've got basically the the deep portion, the, the luscious kind of uh, umami flavor, uh, that flavor that is uh, comforting. Now I'm going to take some of the dried fruits because um, it doesn't matter. The, the apples, the pears, the peaches, those can tend to get mushy if we add them too soon. This also calls for, the, the traditional recipe calls for um, raisins. And raisins don't do too much for me. 
so instead of raisins, but you can use them. I don't want to offend anyone who loves raisins, but um, I like uh, these cranberries, and they are sweetened with uh, apple juice. So, um, but this is what I like, so that's what I'm going to use. And that's the nice thing about this dish, uh, and so many when you're cooking. Uh, sometimes, if you don't mind that it's not exact, um, add something you like. Like the next thing I'm going to add is now the traditional is uh, something called, and I'm not sure if I did it in another segment, but um, it's called Viznaga, and it's a cactus. Nowadays, the cactus, this barrel cactus, uh, the round one, is in, it's on the endangered list. So you can't even get it in Mexico anymore. Uh, so it's hard, very hard to find. I think they said some underground uh, companies do it, but we don't want to use anything that's on the endangered list. So uh, what I did, I love dried apricots. Uh, and so I'm going to be using these. It has that candied, the sweet taste that I imagine when you make this cactus, you have to sweeten it and dehydrate it. So uh, I'm, that's why I'm using the, the apricots. Also, if you don't want to use, um, or if you don't want to use the raisins, I also there's the green raisins uh, that I, I think are wonderful. So I'm going to sprinkle a few in there. I was just going to show them to you, but kind of tempting, so I just put them in there. And then we're going to add the apples. That was one apple. The peach. We don't have a peach. I have used um, nectarine, which is just as fantastic, and sometimes I think even better. And this is sounding a little bit in a bit moisture. Just add that a little bit. Now we add our tomatoes, which have some nice liquid in them. I'm going to keep these keep the pan moisturized too. Is that the word for culinary moisturized? Okay. Maybe not. I am really enjoying the smells, looking at the different textures. I wanna add a little bit of the blanched almonds that have been chopped. And now we come to the seasoning. Now, just like this, there are so many flavors in here. Put that baby all over. I don't want to put the fire up too high. Now I'm going to add a little bit of Mexican oregano. It's a little bit much coarser, of course, than the regular um, oregano. When I say a pinch, I get three feet, two, two fingers in my thumb. And this one, kind of work it through, and then I do this. Roll it around in here. Between your palms. Oh, mmm, smells wonderful. I'm going to try the pepper. Also, three things the same way I pinch it. Maybe two pinches. And the cinnamon, I'm putting my tiny spoon here. So this is about a pinch, but I like to do it in this little teeny spoon. It's about a fourth of a teaspoon. Maybe an eighth. On the recipe, it's correct, so. Mmm. Oh, this is almost smelling like Christmas. 
nice too. With that little bit of cinnamon. So here's what it's looking like with all this wonderful ingredients. So we're now at the best part, and that's the stuffing. So you can see our chilies here have been patiently waiting. I'm going to take this one, open it up, and stuff it. Helps to have it open just a little bit. Press, if you can see that. People aren't going to see that little bits and pieces that you might have left on the outside because it's going to be covered in this beautiful white sauce. This chili is much bigger. Sometimes it helps to to set it down instead of just so I think you can see this and to serve I've got one of my plates from my childhood that I love and reminds me always about my mom my dad who never passed but uh, put down just a little bit of cream sauce here this chili on top of it and the tradition is to cover it all oh, the smells that are coming from this are amazing it's, it's that sweet and savory and then all of a sudden you smell that just get a hint of that cinnamon so don't go crazy with the cinnamon. And I would even double that recipe if you're going to make more than just a one or two. Um, and then you get your... Okay, and we want it to look like that flag. We can put a little bit around here of that parsley. Even add a few of the almonds. Make that plate look festive. And of course, add more of these. Now, doesn't that look like a celebration? to taste it. Mmm. I need a lot of the filling. The poblano is not hot. But that filling is along with the cream like I said, it's a party in your mouth. There's so many things. The little pomegranate seeds burst. Mm-hmm. I get the sweet and the savory. And if you didn't tell me it was mushrooms inside, I wouldn't know. Everything blends together so well. The celebration. So I want to thank you today for coming to taking your time to watch this uh, demonstration. Uh, I am Chef Evangelina from All in All Vegan and uh, just wishing you the best in the kitchen and I hope that you enjoy this recipe as much as we do at home. Thank you so much.
Chef Evangelina, for welcoming us into your kitchen. I could almost smell the delicious food through the screen. And also a quick reminder that if you're one of the first 16 Vallejo residents who joins us for all of the events, including today, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. Next up, we are excited to have the founder and the spirit behind Vallejo's People's Garden, Vilma Aquino. Talk with us about the beauty and importance of gardening. When Food Empowerment Project began our work in Vallejo, we were connected with Vilma and the Vallejo People's Garden. They were one of the first organizations to encourage our work as they had already personally experienced the problem of the lack of access to healthy foods and were working to solve it as well. They assisted us with our initial survey into this issue in the community and continue to serve as a perfect example of not only what Vallejo needs more of, but cities around the country, country desperately deserve and need. Every year at our in-person event, Vallejo's People Garden has offered free seeds to help people get started growing their own food. And this year, not only will you be inspired to grow your own food by Vilma, we will also learn how to grow microgreens so fast you won't believe how easy it can be. Vilma Aquino is a resident of Mare Island who wanted to convert the vacant lot at the corner of East Poplar and Oscar Streets into a garden to grow organic fruits and vegetables for the homeless, provide a place for people to learn about sustainable gardening practices, and to grow friendship and community. The Vallejo People's Garden is a collaboration of many different volunteers and partner organizations and was started in 2010. The beauty of gardens is that they bring together individuals from all cultural, ethnic, and geographic backgrounds to share their traditions and culture. Gardens have the ability to provide therapy for the soul and healing for the spirit. I had the opportunity to speak with Vilma about Vallejo People's Garden and to learn more about their work. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I enjoyed giving it. Please join me in welcoming Vilma Aquino of the Vallejo People's Garden. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I have with me here today Vilma Aquino. She is the founder of Vallejo People's Garden on Mare Island, which was founded in 2010. Vilma, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Erica. Hello, everyone, and I'm happy to be here. Yay! So let's get started with our interview. So what? how did you come to start Vallejo's People Garden, and what was the purpose of it? Well, in 2009, during the recession, I got laid off from my job. And it was at that time, um, I really started to do a lot of self-reflection because I was middle-aged, I was laid off. I didn't know what to do next at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into things that I really enjoyed, which was gardening. So I watched a lot of YouTube videos. And one YouTube video uh, came into mind and it was a guy who was being interviewed just like this except it was at a community garden and everyone behind him were so happy there was a lot of kids running around there were women chatting and just being very uh, sociable and enjoying that great outdoors and it was a light bulb moment for me and I said to myself that's what I wanted to do I wanted to start a community garden and I would run around my neighborhood and I saw this empty lot and I thought it was the perfect place to start that community garden that I had dreamt about. And so I asked the organizers of that land if I could convert it into a community garden and that's how the ball started rolling. That's amazing. That's, I'm really, that's really exciting how you just took a seed and now it's, you know, it's growing. So yeah. Quickly. So, yeah, it was a seed in my head and in my heart. So have you always had a green thumb? No. I've killed a lot of plants along the way. <laughs> um, but since then, I was a master gardener in the 1990s and have been gardening ever since. So it does take a lot of failures and trials and error. Uh, to be good at where I am now. That, I really love that backstory because I think for someone like me who's very new to gardening and plants, I think it's so important to know that the failures, the ups and downs are a part of the process. So 
yeah, with that being said, why is gardening important? And more so, why is it important for folks who are living in Vallejo? It's important to garden anywhere, especially during this crazy times like coronavirus, wildfires, mm -hmm. uh, air pollution. Mm -hmm. Most people aren't able to get out and socialize. So it's important to grow your own food because there's less of an environmental impact. There's less contact with people where you can get coronavirus. Uh, there's less outdoor activity where you breathe in that air pollution from, from all the wildfires. So really now, is a critical time to know to grow your own food. Yes, I love that part about growing your own food. And so mm -hmm. for, for folks like me who don't have green thumbs, what is an easy way for us to start gardening at home? Well, um, you can start buying seeds uh, and you can get a lot of that online. And the package on the seeds will give you directions on how to um, start those seeds and then like watching YouTube videos and just through trial and error to see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you can also grow microgreens which we sell uh, through Farm Fresh and that is providing nutritious food within a 10-day period wow. or at least about a 10-day period. Yeah. Awesome. No, it's very easy. <laughs> I can't wait to try it. And I, I can't wait for everyone to see the microgreens video after this interview plays. I'm really yeah. excited to see that. So what are some of the things that um, you're growing in the Vallejo people's garden that other Vallejoans can grow at home? Well, we just harvested a bunch of heirloom tomatoes, which we offered to the community and this was the first time we had a pop-up market because we were trying to fundraise for the garden since there were too many grants at this time that we could apply to because of COVID. Um, most of the grants we found were being focused on the COVID. And so uh, you can grow tomatoes, zucchini, squash, a lot of the herbs, edible flowers, um, collard greens, so many things right now because we live in a Mediterranean climate. We can pretty much grow anything. That I just got hungry off of all the things you just <laughs> Right. So, yeah. Speaking to the Mediterranean climate, I know some folks are into like the zones. What do you know what zone Vallejo is? Yes, Vallejo is zone nine B. Okay, good to know for those avid gardeners out there. We are zone nine B. Right. Yeah. yeah. So with all the things that you just listed that we can grow and, um, you know, right in our backyards here in Vallejo, do you have any favorite plant-based recipes that you like to make with the vegetables grown in the garden? Yeah, one of my favorites is making these Vietnamese rolls. Uh, it's vegan and we've made it using the uh, yakong. It's a tuber uh, vegetable and spinach using spinach and collard greens and I can share that recipe with you along with the Thai peanut sauce which is absolutely delicious and adding in those microgreens is so nutritious as well too. Wonderful I can't wait to see that recipe now I have something to make for dinner next week. <laughs> okay. And so um, looking at the Vallejo People's Garden, I love how you mentioned that pop-up market that you have. How can folks in Vallejo get involved in the garden? Well, we have volunteer events on uh, Thursday mornings when my master gardener is there. And um, the best thing to do is to email us at info at vallejopeoplesgarden.org if they're interested in volunteering. And for those who do volunteer, one of the benefits is that you uh, are able to uh, have some of the produce that we grow there at the garden um, as a thank you from us. That's a beautiful exchange. Like you folks can come in, help yeah. with the garden, learn about gardening and take home some of the, the fruits yes. of, their, of the labor. Right. And really there's no better way to learn how to garden by, than by actually doing and seeing all the things that we come across. Um, I guess my last question here yep. is when we think about 
Baleo and access to healthy foods, um, how can growing your own food and just the garden, Baleo People's Garden in general, help increase access to healthy foods for our community? Well, the food that we grow at the community garden is um, pretty much, we're all volunteers there. And the food that we grow go to food banks, homeless shelters, and for the volunteers that come to help us um, so that it is accessible to our Vallejo community. I did not know that that is so amazing. So you're literally feeding our, com that's amazing, Vilma. Organic food. <laughs> We don't use any pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, any of those sides. It's all organic. So, yeah, so you... So you know that everything that we grow is, is just stuff from the earth. Fresh, healthy, pesticide, yes. chemical free food straight from the earth. Yes. Yeah, exactly. What? Yep. What more could we ask for? Uh, thank you so much, Vilma, for coming today and telling us all about the garden. And is there a website that folks can go to to find out more information? Well, because we are volunteer run, I really don't have the time to update the website. We do have a Facebook and Instagram, so they can find us uh, on our page, Vallejo People's Garden. And our Instagram is VP Garden. Perfect. Thank you so much. Once again, we're so happy to have the VP Garden here on their island. And I can't wait to come and visit one day and get my hands dirty with you. Thank you, Erica. And thank you, everyone. And I hope that you guys, uh, if you have any questions at all, you can email me if you have any problems that you come across. I'm very willing to help you out in any way I can. And I know the community community appreciates you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>
thank you for that wonderful insight. That video made it seem so simple that even I am now excited to try to grow microgreens. As we continue our celebration of Latinx Heritage Month, we are sure you will not be able to sit in your seat for this next performance. Get ready for colorful, toe-tapping, smile-inducing performances by the group Getzale Ballet Foco Rico Vallejo. Ballet Foco Rico has been a regular performer at our Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. It is such an honor to have them perform at our event as we believe it truly enhances and celebrates some of the diversity of Vallejo. And when else do you see a performance like this at a vegan event? Quetzale Ballet Folclorico is a local Vallejo group that has been performing together for over five years in Solano County and other Bay Area cities. They are a group of loving mothers who keep their Mexican culture alive by teaching their daughters the art of dancing. The dances you are about to watch are from the states of Colima and Sinaloa in Mexico. Without further ado, it is now time to enjoy the vibrant energy and dedication of these amazing young women. Please join me in welcoming Quetzali Ballet Folklorico Vallejo.
Thank you for that energetic performance. Wasn't that amazing, everyone? Next, we want to introduce a proud Zikonex and the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project. Lauren Ornelas is the founder and president of Food Empowerment Project, the organization behind the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest. FEP hosts the Vallejo Healthy Food Fest each year to amplify the voices of Vallejoans and to show that they are coming together to create unique solutions within their community. The goal of this event is to create enthusiasm and a demand for change and to share with everyone that healthy food is not only healthy and delicious, but accessible to those, should be accessible to those in Vallejo. Food Empowerment Project uses this event to spotlight the beauty and diversity of our community. Lauren has been, an active, has been active in the animal rights movement since 1987 and founded P Food Empowerment Project in 2007 to showcase how we can create a more just and sustainable world by recognizing the power of one's food choices. She has also investigated factory farms, run consumer campaigns, and worked with activists nationwide. Here to discuss the importance of the lack of access to healthy foods, please join me and welcome Lauren Ornelas. I'm Lauren Ornelas. I'm the founder of Food Empowerment Project. Thank you so much for coming and listening in on our Vallejo Healthy Food Fest this year. As I'm sure you know, we've had to do it differently this year due to COVID-19, but we wanted to make sure that we still were able to celebrate the beautiful community of Vallejo. Not sure if this is your first food fest with us or your third or your fourth or your fifth, but we're really glad to have you here. I just wanted to give a little bit of background and the, some of the work that we've been doing in the community, as well as why we're doing it and what we see as some of the next steps. So, although many of you who live in Vallejo are very familiar with the problem with lack of access to healthy food, um, this is a problem that takes place not only in Vallejo, not only in the United States, but around the globe. And it's primarily an issue that impacts Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. So we have been taking a look at these issues in Northern California, and we were asked um, a number of years ago by one of the founding members of the Black Panther Party, David Hilliard, to take a look at what was happening where he lived. Uh, I had connected with him to learn more about the Black Panther Party's free breakfast program, and in turn told him about our work. He asked me if we could take a look to see what was happening 
there in terms of lack of access to healthy food. So that's really why we came to Vallejo. From there, we connected with other um, activists in the area to make sure that our work would be valuable to them, and we found out it would be. So we joined up with organizations such as Vallejo People's Garden um, to try to take a look at what access to healthy foods um, look like in the community. And we first did this by doing little focus groups to try to make sure that the fruits and vegetables and other foods that we would be serving would actually be culturally appropriate. As I'm sure many of you know, Vallejo is incredibly diverse and um, represents the Black, Filipinx, and Latinx community members. And so we, incur we increased um, the various types of fruits and vegetables um, as part of our survey sheet. And so what we did is we gathered volunteers um, by People's Garden, collected some as well. And we actually surveyed every establishment that sold food except for restaurants and fast food. So we surveyed the grocery stores, the convenience stores and liquor stores. And what you can see here is just a sample of um, the survey tool. The survey tool actually ended up being quite long, um, but this just gives you an idea of some of the, the fruits um, that we surveyed for in the community. After we collected all the data, we put out our report highlighting what we found in our survey results. And we shared this information and in our reports with policymakers uh, from the city council up to our federal legislators. And this report is available um, to you. Um, if you live in Vallejo, we'd be happy to mail you a copy in English or in Spanish. Uh, they are also available on our website at foodispower.org. But some of our findings we found, um, and again, if you live in the community, you're probably very familiar with this, that the vast majority of liquor stores and convenience stores are in the low-income communities, predominantly the black and brown communities, where you have 88% of all the liquor stores and 71% of all the convenience stores in the low income communities. This area also has very few grocery stores. So um, you can see here in this pie chart that 46% of the convenience stores and 29% of liquor stores is actually where people living in these communities have to get their food from. Now, if you look at the higher income area pie chart, you can actually still see though that the community as a whole doesn't have a whole lot of grocery stores but it's far worse in the black and brown communities than any of the other ones. Now, we also looked at the availability of meat and dairy alternatives. And we did this because we know that one, a diet high in fruits and vegetables is better for your health, but we also would like people to be able to choose if they wanna go vegan or not, if they wanna not participate in the suffering of non-human animals. Um, and again, as a vegan organization, um, this little calf represents um, why, why we encourage people to not consume any type of animal product. Um, but we also wanted to point out a couple of other things. One is that, the, if you can see here, very few um, locations had access to meat and dairy alternatives. And although a lot of people call uh, what happens in these communities food deserts or things such as that, we, uh, we kind of agree more with those who want us to call it what it righteously should be called, which are which is food is food apartheid. So um, that is what we call it. And, and I think that dairy really highlights why we talk about this, because in our communities in black and brown indigenous communities, many times what's available to us is actually cow or goat milk. And for those of us like myself, who's a very proud Chicana, so I'm uh, Mexican, um, Columbus actually brought cows over on the fourth voyage. And so it's not something that my ancestors normally drink. It wasn't something that was normal to our diets. It wasn't something that we had available to us. So that's why many of us are what some people call lactose intolerant. Um, and Food Empowerment Project isn't a fan of that term because once again, it puts the onus on black and brown people as if there's something wrong with us because we don't digest the milk of another species. When and in fact, it's a product of colonization and it's a product of colonization that we're still dealing with today. So when these locations don't have these dairy alternatives, what's happening is that we're being forced to drink cow's milk or goat's milk, which is actually gonna make us sick. So we do feel like we need to, to draw these connections and show that this lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which is good for our health, and the lack of alternatives to cow milk, all it's doing is negatively impacting our health. It's negatively impacting the health of black and brown people in the communities and around the world. So one of the other things we recognized when we started doing our work in Vallejo, and some of you are probably very familiar with this because you've lived it, 
is that there's a Safeway location in downtown where senior living facilities were, as well as a lot of black and brown people living there. And a Safeway had been based downtown. They moved from that location, they relocated miles away. And when they left that location, they put what's called a restrictive deed on their former property, preventing any grocery store from moving in for 15 years, which deprived that community from having a grocery store. So this is an effort that we have taken nationwide, trying to get Safeway to change this corrupt, inhumane and unjust policy. We have a petition on our website that we would love for you to sign. And if you have any type of recollection about this or anything you could write or do a video and share with us, we love to share that with that corporation as well. So after we did our report, we then followed up in focus groups. We did seven focus groups in Vallejo with um, the Filipinx community, black community, one we did in Spanish and one we did with the homeless. Um, we did these focus groups. We fed everybody a vegan meal and we paid everybody $50 for their time. And we released our report again, sharing it with all policymakers. And what we found in this report was similar to what we've seen before, which is one of the biggest barriers to people being able to eat healthy and being able to access fresh food is actually the cost of it, which is why we've really pushed towards supporting living wages, rather it be from a local level to corporate levels, but all living wages to make sure there's some equity. Because for people to be able to eat healthy, they have to be able to afford the food. As an organization that works on farm worker justice issues as well, we know that we don't need that produce getting any cheaper. We need more equity. We need everybody to be able to have living wages and to be able to afford the food. We also found that many people who were immigrants who were um, living in the community ate healthier from their home countries than they do here because they didn't want to buy things like tomato sauce. They rather use fresh tomatoes. Um, in terms of our solutions, um, we really look to things like people growing their own food and supporting places like Vallejo People's Garden. We also really want to bring something like Mandela Grocery Cooperative to Vallejo. In fact, we did three community meetings, bringing the owner of one of the owners of uh, Mandela to the community. We fed everybody a delicious vegan meal. Um, but our goal is really to have something like Mandela's Worker Cooperative. And the reason why is because the workers own the business. They make the decisions on the profits, they make the decisions on the benefits that the community is gonna get. And they also, this type of job provides skills. It provides entrepreneurial skills for anybody who works there for a lifetime. So we really wanna see what happens in Vallejo. And we, in our um, focus groups, we had 100% support from everybody. Once they understood what a worker-owned cooperative was, they really wanted to be a part of something like that in the community. The, our focus groups found people wanted to buy food locally. They wanted to have businesses that were local. So, you know, our hope now is moving forward and we want to work with all of you is to see more people being able to grow their own food as well as having something like a worker owned cooperative. So the money that's invested is spent in the community is invested back into the community and we can help the community thrive. So as always, we welcome any of your questions, your feedback, and we definitely want you to get involved because we know that we can help Vallejo turn the corner on having more access to healthy foods, having better health in the community if we all work together. And we thank all of you so much for the time and effort you have put with us and the surveying, the focus groups, and trying to get Mandela um, to come to the community. And um, yeah, I guess that's it. We hope you really enjoy yourself at the rest of the festival. And uh, we do hope to be able to do it in person next year. If not, we'll see you online next year. Thank you. Thank you for those words of inspiration and reminding us to continue to fight for healthy foods in all of our communities. The next video we're about to show is a special message from Donald Jordan, or as I affectionately call him, Dad. He has been a Vallejo resident for over 30 years and is proud to call Vallejo his home. He has a long and storied involvement with many Vallejo organizations and is here to talk to us about one organization that is working to improve our town. 
The African American Alliance or AAA is a Vallejo based organization that embraces the African American community as a family and continues to work towards gaining full and representative access to the economic and social political institutions of Vallejo and Solano County that our communities rely on. The Alliance aspires to educate the community on the political process and welcomes all who wish to join. Today, the African American Alliance has an important message for us, and we will be hearing about the importance of registering to vote in this year's elections, as well as the 2020 United States Census. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Donald Jordan. Welcome to Vallejo Healthy Food Festival. This is Don Jordan with the African American Alliance. I'm the chairperson, and I want to ask you to vote this November the 3rd. We are a nonprofit organization that um, helps get the word out about political events in town. Um, we're, non, we're not Democratic or Republican, and we help um, get people to know about what's going on in town in Vallejo as well as in Solano County. The main reason I'm here today is to ask you to vote this November the 3rd, 2020. Your vote is important, not only because of the national election, but also because of local candidates that are running for city and county government, as well as the state propositions that are on the ballot this year. Also, be counted in the U.S. 2020 Census. Go, if you have not been counted yet or filled out your census form, go to 2020census.gov and fill out the application. It takes you about five minutes and you'll be counted and it will help us uh, plan for hospitals, road construction, as well as other government services that you, the citizen, need. So look forward to seeing you virtually at the Vallejo Healthy Food Festival, as well as on November the 3rd. Hope to see you out at the polls. See ya. Thank you for that important message about voting in this year's elections and being counted in this year's census. Every person can make a difference. Before we close today's event, we are going to bring Food Empowerment Project's team on screen to answer all the questions you have been sending us throughout the event. Please send us any other questions you may have now through the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. And we will do our best to get through as many of them as possible before we run out of time. And our last reminder that if you're one of the first 16 participants who's a Vallejo resident to join us for all of our events, we will be giving you a free vegan cookbook. If you haven't already done so, please fill out the survey using the link shared in the chat box. Now, while we give you a moment to post your questions, I'm going to turn it over to FEP's executive director to say a few words. Thank you, Erica. I'm sure you all felt Erica's energy and enthusiasm throughout the program. As our Vallejo community organizer, hasn't Erica been an amazing MC for this event? Thank you. Um, as Erica said, I am uh, Sharanya Krishna Prasad, and I'm the executive director of Food Empowerment Project. And on behalf of our organization, I just want to thank you all for attending today's event and for your support of FEP's work in Vallejo. I hope you enjoyed the program and you will join us again for the next two Saturdays because we have an amazing selection of cooking demos and programs in store for you. So please don't miss out. When we first decided to make this event virtual, none of us were sure how we could pull it off. But what you saw today has truly been a team effort behind the scenes. And I wanna take this opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the team. Ethan Eldreth is our web content and database manager and has been the wizard behind all the technology that we use to create today's videos. Ethan's an invaluable member of the team and I'm relieved and grateful to have him here with us to help with all the technical logistics. Thank you, Ethan. Our communications and marketing manager, Erica Galera, helped promote the event online and with the media. And in the weeks leading up to the event, she also worked very closely with Erica and Ethan to rehearse and ensure that this event went very smoothly. Thank you, Erica. And you've all already met Lauren Ornelas, but I cannot exclude her from being mentioned. 
Lauren founded Food Empowerment Project and has led our programs, including our Vallejo work since the start. Her visionary thinking has made our organization what it is today. I am grateful for Lauren every day. So thank you, Lauren, for everything. Thank you again for being with us, and I hope you and your family stay happy, healthy, and safe. Lauren, would you like to start us off on talking about the Safeway campaign and more? Hi. So one of the questions I think was um, mentioning that this was a kind of familiar, like my explaining what was going on in Vallejo was similar to something they've experienced in Washington, D.C. And I think one of the interesting things to note is that, as I mentioned in my video, that this is going on, what Safeway's been doing is going on across the country. And in fact, Washington, D.C. is one of those areas. In fact, there's a city council member in D.C. who's been introducing emergency legislation every few years to prevent Safeway from impacting her community. So um, again, this has been going on for a long time. It's happening in communities across the U.S. And it's one of the most sickening things to realize that an institution that's supposed to be there to provide healthy foods for communities may in fact be the reason why they don't have it. So anyway, we wanted to make sure that you knew in DC, this is happening there as well. And if um, you still have family there, we do have the information for the, the woman who's been working to fight safe way from doing this in that community. Thank you so much for that, Lauren. And we're gonna pull some more questions from the chat and answer them now. So one of the questions from Norma is, um, regarding Safeway, do other major chains behave similarly or do they stand alone? Lauren, do you have some more information on that? I do, and you know, it's all of them, to be honest. I shouldn't say all of them. It's common practice, right? So we do know that even like Starbucks may do this. Um, we know Walmart does this. Um, the reason why we've picked in on Safeway, one reason is because it literally hurt the community of Vallejo and that's a community we're working in. Um, also Safeway is, is a, somewhat of a local entity. So we want to be able to hold local corporations accountable. Um, so we, we're really just focusing on Safeway and like other campaigns that I've done, hope to have it be in effect when one cor corporation decides to, I don't know, not prohibit community members from having access to healthy foods, um, but others may soon follow. So, you know, when I first learned about this and I was speaking to an attorney for the grocery store industry, he said, this has been going on forever. You're never going to change it. And to me, that was my welcome to start changing this. So we really um, hope that you all can um, help us fight this. And so we can kind of just have this done away with. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. Um, did you want me to, I, I can answer. So uh, Norma, I think you also asked about the police and Vallejo and um, <laughs> um, yes, they're horrible. Um, they killed a, I'm sure most people know they killed a protester. Um, who was participating in Black Lives Matter, a, a young activist from San Francisco. Um, Sean Montarosa, I'm not sure if that's his last name, um, was murdered by cops in, in Vallejo. Um, we have never, we don't seek out working with them ever. So they are not a part of anything we do or any who we are. In fact, when other people have encouraged to connect us, we know that to some degree, it's a deterrent for Black, Brown, and Indigenous community members to feel safe. And our goal has always been to make everybody feel safe and welcoming at our events. Most definitely. So um, another question I um, saw in our Q&A, this is for both Lauren and Sharanya. Uh, Stacy Harris and Shelly have said that thank you so much for having this online. Um, and they would also be very interested in keeping it in virtual as well as in person to give people options. How do you, how do you feel about having both in person and virtual for the 2021 uh, Vallejo Healthy Food Fest? I would love to be able to do it both ways. So um, we will look into ways to do it. And like Lauren said before, we're not sure if we're going to be able to hold it in person next year. But if we do, then we will make it available online as well. 
Yeah, we're very, you know, lucky that this year, in a sense, doing it virtually has allowed us to do things like closed caption. The fact that all of these um, are already, the videos that you've seen are translated into Spanish already. We're going to eventually have the entire event translated into Spanish. We've always offered um, people to let us know if they need any type of assistance. We've never heard anything, but I think based on this event, already hearing about the Spanish being important, the caption being important, that we will, without even having to anybody ask us, we will be certain at our, in our live events and um, hearing you all say that you may not be able to get out to enjoy something like this um, is a definite reason as well that we will do our best. And you all telling us what you need and that you want us to do these events, that's all we need to hear to make sure that um, you want us around and doing these types of events. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Another question in the chat was about buying uh, and supporting Vallejo People's Garden and our Air, the other Erica Communications uh, and Marketing Director just said a reminder to email them at info at vallejopeoplesgarden.org for information or volunteer at vallejopeoplesgarden.org to get back to them about volunteering. So we hope that you all will do that as well. So another question in the chat about how can local residents for Safeway and others like Raley's and Walmart to change their policies? Lauren, is that you? Yeah, so just so everybody knows up front, we have tried to get the city council in Vallejo repeatedly to pass an ordinance in Vallejo preventing any grocery store from doing something like that in the community. In fact, we've given them the full language um, that was provided to us by the city council member in Washington, D.C., um, so that they didn't have to do any work. They've had their city manager take a look at it, and every time um, I follow up, I don't hear back. Um, there's uh, a lot of um, city council members, um, current mayor, um, who we have um, provided this information for, again, just to make sure that nobody harms um, Vallejo from accessing healthy foods, and I, we can never get it um, to anybody in city council to take it seriously. So we hope uh, maybe things will change this year. And that's a great reminder to remember that we have to get out and vote on November 3rd. Another question we received was, how can we help and support the farm workers right now, especially during the fires? Are there any petitions, a way for local laws that can be changed to protect them? So Food Empowerment Project, um, when COVID hit, um, we did a quick fundraiser so that we could provide food to the farm workers and also to provide them from, with school supplies because we asked the farm workers that we work with, you know, what is it that you need right now? And that's what we heard. We also just recently did our school supply drive for the children of farm workers, um, which we were able to deliver over 625 um, backpacks filled with school supplies to farm workers in Sonoma County as well as in the Central Valley. Um, unfortunately, a law, uh, I'm sorry, a piece of legislation that was introduced that would um, give farm workers the ability to have paid sick leave um, and all workers um, pulled farm workers out of that piece of legislation. Now the legislation, we still want it to pass, it will help all workers get that type of benefit, but farm workers were excluded. Um, there are possibly is another bill on the desk of the governor right now um, for farm workers, um, which we can tell you about. I don't have the number with me. Um, but right now, it's just a matter of um, what can you do is still always honor the boycotts called by farm workers. That means boycotting Wendy's um, for not paying the Coalition of Immokalee workers one more penny per pound for the, the tomatoes that they pick and respect the San Quintin farm workers in Mexico. Um, but also it seems like Driscoll issues have been popping up all over the state of California as well to boycott Driscoll berries. And it's one thing for you not to buy it, but it's really important you tell the stores why you're not buying these berries or why you're not eating at these places because they need to know that you care about farm workers and that you are doing your part um, to support them. So um, again, it's respecting their, their thing. We may end up, you know, if things get bad again, we may have to do another um, drive for food for the farm workers. Again, ironic considering they're the ones who feed us. Um, but if you are interested in the piece of legislation that might be on the governor's desk, just let us know and I can follow up with you. Great question. 
Thank you for that, Lauren. And I guess this is a question for the entire team. Uh, Norma says, okay, then with this awesome team, I wonder whether any college student or other has studied your methods and strategies. Uh, more nonprofits would benefit from your various approaches when entering community XOXO. So any feedback on um, FEP's methodologies and the way that we uh, impact local communities and how others can do the same? Um, we, we have been asked um, about the way that we do things because you are absolutely right. <laughs> we do things a little bit differently, definitely differently than most speaking groups and a lot differently than more siloed groups because that's a part of our mission, right? Our mission is to combine all these issues. So we have had um, just researchers from Australia and even um, I think Stanford reach out and just ask questions about how we do the things that we do and why. But um, you know, we're, we're always happy to talk to anybody about it and just really happy that you, you like how we do things. That means a lot. Anyone else have any thoughts from the team? All right, so we are coming towards the end of our Q&A session. If you have any other questions, please drop them in the Q&A box right now and we will definitely answer them as soon as possible. I'm looking through the Q&A right now and there was a lot of support for Chef Evangelina's uh, torching method for her uh, peppers. That was really awesome to watch that happen and listen to her food sing. And we also have a lot of comments about how beautiful the Quetzali Ballet Puerto Rico dancing was as well. So this week's theme was getting our hands dirty. Uh, would anyone from the team like to share how they like to get their hands dirty since we've been at home during this uh, pandemic? Anyone have any uh, suggestions on how they've been getting their hands dirty this, this year? I can chime in and I know Erica on the team also does this, but uh, I grow a lot of produce just here in my backyard. I do feel very lucky to have the outdoor space and I have just since the pandemic. Before that, I lived in an apartment which did not even have a balcony. So I don't know how I could have managed in that sort of situation. Um, but right now I grow tomatoes, cucumbers um, and a whole bunch of flowers as well. Awesome. I also do the same. I, I've, al I've also been doing more houseplants. So getting my hands dirty inside instead of outside because of all the wildfire smokes, it's been really difficult to kind of breathe <laughs> and enjoy outside time. Um, so I've been staying inside mostly with my houseplants and um, just transplanting, you know, propagating all that good stuff. All right, thank you so much, Sharanya and Erica. We have a few more questions before our Q and A ends. Um, I will, I will. I'm just about to announce what we're going to, what you can expect next week. But Don Baker asks, I am in Bakersfield now, and just wondering how do we know where not to buy from, for example, Driscoll's, in order to support our farm workers. I have only been in California and here for three years, so this is all new to me, seeing it firsthand. Yeah, I bet that it is. It is. I'm not from California either, and it's amazing to actually see our food grow and see the people pick it. And it's a humbling experience, I think. Um, but really what we try to do is just listen to what the farm workers are asking for. And so there may be other farms that are really horrible, but until they ask us to do something like boycott them, we're not doing anything. Our goal is to support them and whatever they're asking for. So right now, those are the only two active boycotts that we know of, the Driscoll's Berries and the Wendy's boycott um, called by farm workers themselves. So that's kind of what we know at this point. But thank you. 
Thank you so much, Lauren, for those words. So now we're going to wrap things up. Thank you all for all your questions and for participating in today's event. Today we got our hands dirty with some chiles and nogadas, saw nutritious microgreens grown in a matter of days, and honored an amazing woman who changed the heart and soul of Vallejo forever. We celebrated the start of Latinx Heritage Month and were reminded about the importance of using our vote and our voice. I really hope you enjoyed today's program and we are excited for you to join us next week. Next week's theme is home and hearth. We will share simple and comforting recipes, learn about grocery store cooperatives, and journey to the islands of the Pacific to watch Hawaiian and Tahitian dances. Thank you again for joining us. If you're interested in viewing this event with Spanish captions, the video will be available one week after today. If you are registered, keep an eye on your email for when it will be available and we will send um, and we will send it to you. Uh, see you next Saturday afternoon at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Have a great day and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.